So, um, yeah, for those of you who don't know me yet, uh, my name is Alesh. I am the president of the KDV, but I've also been doing KDE software for the longest time. I'm also on the LAS organizing team uh, since a few years now. So if you have or want to talk about this kind of things, you can find me later and, and we can discuss them. Here's my email uh, in case you want to reach out. That's always uh, fine if you want to. Um, so when I was thinking about what to talk about in these LAS, instead of saying this whole thing of like, what have I been doing? What new things can we be talking about? I thought, all right, uh, we're having a talk about like with the different people doing apps in Linux and what are, what is probably one of the first things that you will be doing when you come from, well, our side of the world um, being the cute side of the world uh, and, and you want to approach the platform and I figured uh, FTG desktop portals was a good uh, first step. So instead of talking something about, uh, about something that I've been well, actively working on, uh, well, thinking what would be useful for you. Um, but if you have any questions, you can stop me at any time. I hope that it's gonna be a light and um, maybe even a, a bit quick talk, but uh, it's, it's perfectly fine if, if you stop me. So a portal is, uh, or actually just the portals and uh, well, the different portals are the technology that was developed by the Flatpak people back when they were designing it and they realized that as soon as you have well containers, you need to be able to like get out of your containers and get some information from, from the outside world. Um, and effectively, it's a deeper service that well has a foot on each side of the container. It sees what's on your normal OS if you want, and it has another foot on your uh, container and uh, you can talk to it, you won't be able to talk to all of your operating system, but you can definitely talk to the portals. And the portal system has also some kind of infrastructure uh, to either, well, fetch the information that you're asking it, or, uh, well, talk to the shell, the, um, the desktop environment, if you want, um, and figure out, well, integrated ways of requesting that information, usually through a dialogue, but it can be any other way, or like, no dialogue. It's up to the uh, desktop environment to do that. I was talking about Platbook earlier, but um, because that's where it was coming from, but this, is, uh, this technology is also being used right now for Snaps, because they uh, also have this same problem, uh, because they, like, it's not a container, I think, technically speaking, but it's still well, sandboxed, and you need to also have a service that is on, on each side, and like, a lot of the uh, abstractions also uh, are necessary over there. Um, and like I was saying, uh, the it's, uh, desktop environment will also have their own implementation of it. There's the one from GNOME, there's the one from Plasma. Uh, well, we call it KDE, but well, you know what I mean. And there's others, I think that WR Roots, they have their own one, and probably others as well. Now, um, you can see here um, the list of the portals. Let me see if I can press, and then we can take a look at list, what it looks like. Uh, oops. Boop. So here we can see the documentation for all of them. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, it has like these two feet, one on the operating system side and one on the app side. So this is what you would talk to as an application, and these are the ones you would talk to as the desktop environment, or more specifically, like the component that talks to the portals and implements them, um, we'll be talking to this. So um, effectively, it's like a mirror of this, this uh, or very similar API, not exactly the same, but uh, well, similar. If we, if we look at what we have here, for example, we can see like there's um, the uh, maybe screenshot one, the screencasting, there's a good number of them, of, of things that obviously, like, they're not uh, something that you would be able to, like, fetch from, from a container. They're all things that uh, are, are meaningful as, as uh, outside of the context of your application. Like, it's something that you will need, because if you're a, 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 a screenshot application, you will need to be able to take screenshots. But um, 
obviously not everyone needs to take them. Something interesting about the uh, portals and how things have been evolving is that, um, for example, it's something that we rely on for uh, Wayland as well. Like on X11, for example, for doing screencasting things, we used to like have X11 APIs to do that. Uh, considering how the security model has been designed for Wayland, this is not something that we do from Wayland itself, and instead of like creating such APIs in Wayland, well, since uh, the portals already had something for screencasting, this is something that is implemented through, through it as well. So uh, you will find also applications that are like normal desktop applications, normal, let's say, legacy, or maybe legacy sounds like it's too old. Um, traditional, let's say, yeah, traditional uh, uh, applications that will uh, be using the portals API to do things like, for example, um, uh, well, screencasting in Linux or, uh, or on Wayland or maybe um, remote desktop things, I don't know. Um, we can get back to here if you have questions later, um, but in any case, I would recommend you like go into the portal things and you take a look at uh, well, the ones that are available and what things you can do or not, and it's always interesting. Uh, some, when preparing the presentation, I thought were uh, useful to mention were like the screencasts and screenshots, which are those that I mentioned. Um, screencast because it does offer like a, uh, a useful way of, of requesting the outputs and the, the streams, which uh, has always been a, a complex thing. Um, screenshot is a bit clunky, especially if you're implementing a screenshot specific application because it opens a new dialog every time, but well, it does depend on the uh, implementation. URI for opening URLs, um, camera also for uh, requesting uh, well, your cameras, um, and we also have, um, um, bum, bum, did I go back? Global shortcuts, I did that this one because I created it and I, it's very close to my heart. Um, it's the one we designed for um, having access to global shortcuts. So your application can say, I have these actions that need to be able to be triggered from uh, well, when my application is not focused. So you get to be able to do that from on, on Wayland right now and well, potentially on, on X11 as well if it's properly implemented in, in an X11 session as well. Um, but otherwise, for example, on Wayland, uh, given the uh, permission model, you would not be able to sniff on the uh, keyboard like uh, X11 applications were doing, uh, just to see that whether um, keystroke was uh, hit uh, at some point. We have also the inhibit uh, for uh, inhibiting notifications and suspend and things like that. And the game mode, game mode is <laughs> one that I learned only by preparing this presentation, but I found it was kind of fun. Uh, it's for, uh, in case you're developing a well, performance demanding game, you can say, give me a higher power um, profile for the CPU and things like that, which uh, I guess it can be handy and it's, and it's something that we wouldn't be doing from a normal process anyway. Right? Now my talk, if you saw the title, was um, about Qt apps and I have not talked about anything related to Qt so I better get to it. Um, my, uh, my presentation could be condensed into, uh, well, these are all Diva services. Uh, just talk Divas without service and then be done with it. It would be a much uh, simpler presentation, but um, maybe it's also not that helpful, so I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper there. Um, well, uh, as you very well know, Kit is a framework that is trying to abstract uh, a number of platforms. We can use um, Kit on Windows, on Mac, on iOS, on Android, on Linux, and then within Linux, we also can use it inside of Flatpak, but also outside of Flatpak, uh, in Snap, and well, AppImage, and all of these, right? And what we try, which is well, something, is to make sure that it's always doing the, the right thing for the platform, right? There's always uh, like different kind of fallbacks and stuff, but if there's um, 
anything that is uh, reasonably native for, for the platform, uh, we, well, we get to do that, right? Now, uh, there's a number of things that um, within the uh, Qt abstractions, Qt will already be doing, right? Um, I tried to list them here. These are the ones that I could find from, uh, well, cursory search. There might be others, but I'm not, I would be surprised if there were a lot more. Um, these are the important ones anyway. Um, mainly the file dialog. So you've all remembered these days where uh, you would get a random file dialog on random applications depending on the toolkit, depending on the, um, the desktop environment you are on, et cetera. Um, this is something that uh, the portals have addressed by providing uh, well, a portal for opening a file and giving the, the file into the application. Now, since it's the desktop environment creating the dialog, you will always be getting the same uh, open file dialog for, for each application. Um, this is uh, also happening on, on Qt as well, and it will be, it will be used. Uh, very similar use case is also the color picker. Um, if you have an application that wants to pick a color in your, in your screen, um, Qt did have some ways of, of getting, uh, well, a screenshot and stuff, but since we have the abstraction from the portal, like there's a color picking portal, or maybe just a function in one of the other portals, uh, well, we use that, and then it looks integrated and proper, and it gives us the, the pixel we wanted, which is uh, what it's all about. Uh, opening URLs, uh, we will also be, uh, if you use from your application the native, uh, well, Qt Desktop Services Open URL uh, function, which is what everybody uses in Qt to open a URL. Uh, if you're in, within a, um, a container, for example, it won't try to like launch something from within the container. It will get to like get outside and tell the operating system, this URL, do whatever with it. Um, and that is be it a uh, normal URL or a, an, if it's an email, so a mail to URL, it will also be going through a different entry point into the portals uh, and, and, and do it. Um, that's not to say that we are like supporting everything. There's more stuff that could be added. Um, looking into it when preparing the talk quickly, I thought like we could be doing a bit more like network monitoring. Uh, at the moment, we're uh, talking directly to Network Manager, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there is a network uh, monitoring portal. This could also be added. Uh, also for location, we have some information, right? So like there's room for improvement. It's not even that hard to do. Uh, it's a matter of like sitting down and carrying it off to like take it all the way as well many things in life are, right? Um, not that, uh, well, it's necessary to do it right now, right? But whatever. Um, I mean, there's the, uh, the option of like getting uh, Qt abstractions and, and implementing it to use the portals, but we also can just access the portals in, from the, the application. Like I said, there are a debug service, and you can just talk to it so you can do your thing, which is also part, I guess, the reason why we uh, didn't, well, end up adding the rest of the things, right? Like abstractions always happen at different levels. Um, also, there's not a lot of things that are just not abstracted to in Qt because like, uh, you don't need to abstract 100% of the things. Um, so you can just be accessing them explicitly. Uh, what I mean by that, uh, I mean just talking to the deeper service. Uh, in, in, within KDE software, we've been doing that in a number of ways. Uh, what I found that works the best is by using the generated um, interfaces file. For those of you who have not done that before, uh, let me try to like, give some perspective. Uh, when working with Dbus, uh, I think that is the case on the, on the G wall. I am not that knowledgeable there but I am pretty sure that it's somewhat the same case. You will have, uh, and also in Qt, you will have APIs that lets you well, talk to Dbus and say, I want to talk to this service and this path and uh, call this method and connect to this service. You can do all of that like from um, just an API, but that uh, forces you to go through like, um, well, very abstract and like, um, 
well, code because you you um, need to uh, remember all of the paths and all of the things. And I mean, they're all strings, right? So if something changes on the service, how it works, your application will still think or will still try to do the things. It will be trying or well, returning error messages that you need to catch, and uh, it's it's well not all that efficient. On the other hand, uh, most Diva services and the FTG desktop portals definitely do. Uh, we'll offer uh, some XML files that um, will define all of the entry, entry points into uh, one DPAS object, um, which, well, I mean, matches very well how we work in, in Qt and C++ because like DBUS is also uh, object-oriented in its workings and, and so is Qt, so um, you can easily say, like, let's take this um, DBUS service and turn it into a Qt object interface and then you can just talk about it, uh, talk to it as a normal um, system. We can take a look later, maybe if you want, into what it looks like. But effectively, what this CMake code does here is say, uh, take this uh, interface file and it will create a class with, uh, or a header file with that name. And it will be added to the sources uh, variable so that it gets compiled when you're building. And, and you're good to go. Then you can call this class that you're including here and, and life is, is smooth. Um, something that you will see at times is that Qt is sometimes picky when you're generating these interfaces. Um, you will need to annotate the arguments for uh, some of the parameters and be telling them what type they are. This, uh, this is for, um, well, variant maps. Variant maps is what on the Dbus glib uh, type lingo is an A brace, SV brace thing, uh, which is effectively a string to variant map, um, which we need to do it like this. Um, admittedly, I find it a bit weird that we're not doing this for every uh, variant map because um, like 99% of the annotations I've seen in this DBus file is to do exactly this. Uh, maybe we could <laughs> just fix Qt and make it do this thing uh, by default. I'm pretty sure that they didn't do it because like Qvariant map will need every uh, key to be like unique, right? Whereas in an array of strings and variants, you could theoretically have two keys that are um, the same. Well, whatever. Um, in the cases that the type is different, uh, you can still do it. Uh, you just need to have on the value uh, um, a type that can be serialized uh, from and to a QDBus variant. This is done through um, C++ operators. Uh, if you look up the documentation, you will see how to do that. It's, it's not even hard. It, and you can always like copy and paste. It's a matter of telling uh, the, the compiler or uh, QDBus if you want how to convert a value coming from DBus into a value that, you're, that you can understand and that is shaped in the way that you care. Um, in the screencasting front, uh, and maybe because that's kind of what I've been working on, I thought it would be useful to uh, mention that um, like the screencasting APIs will be uh, based on Pipewire, Pipewire being this uh, service that does audio and video streams. Uh, obviously for screencasting, we mostly care about the video aspect of it. And well, doing the whole Pipewire uh, bits is uh, somewhat uh, complex, like you need to do uh, quite a bit of boilerplate uh, code to, to integrate it. Uh, and since I had to do uh, quite a bit of that uh, in the recent years for implementing, uh, well, the screencasting, and uh, we use it for uh, also a number of, of um, components in Plasma, we created this framework that you can use, um, so it allows you to put your um, a Pipewire stream uh, well in a QML view, you can just put it by by adding saying take this uh, node from from Pipewire and put it well wherever you want, and 
it just does it transparently. Um, but if you're doing other things, like the downloading uh, I implemented for our uh, KRFB, which is the remote desktop application, so you can say, uh, from this pipe wire, I turn it into a bitmap that I can send through the network, and then my VNC client or whatever will get it on the other side. And well, right now you can also have convenient API for uh, well getting the image and understanding it, which is also kind of handy. And then the recording, because we added uh, video recordings in, in in Plasma on the last release of of, of um, Spectacle. Um, which was out, I think, a few weeks ago. Uh, well, then, now you can do that. You can say, this uh, video stream I'm getting, you put it into this file, and, uh, well, everything is working marvelous. Um, I thought we could maybe take a look right now quickly into what this um, Dbus glue code would look like. Um, I'm aware it can be a bit daunting, but uh, let's try to like go through it together briefly. Yeah, let's not try not to explode collectively. And uh, be happy. It's a bit hard to read the text though, right? It's a bit like weirdly pixelated. <clears throat> well, um, you can also trust that things work. Uh, I, I was uh, mentioning earlier about uh, serializing device um, arguments. So this is what I was talking about. This, for example, to, like there we have this stream type. The stream type is a struct that has an ID and some options. So we're basically saying it's a structure and you put them into this thing. It's using like this, uh, well, somewhat common uh, syntax from C++ uh, to do the things. And then later when we do the Divas stuff, we can just say, you put it into this uh, object and then you can, you can handle it. We can see here. Um, so like I was talking about before, the generating of the interfaces. Um, so what we will be doing here is um, requesting um, an XDG desktop uh, portal uh, from, for sc screencast, uh, any stream. So uh, what the user will be getting is uh, dialog saying choose one of these streams much like you get when you go into like Firefox or whatever and say I want to share my screen or whatever on on your big blue button talk um, and in there uh, we just need to tell it like what's the service name well, the the path and which path we're using which is well, how uh, Tibas always works it's a bit uh, Convoluted that way, but as soon as like you have that, you can then use this interface file uh, and say and well, go with it, right? Um, if we look at the documentation, maybe it's useful first. Um, 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 did we close that? No. If we go into the documentation for screencast, no, that's screenshot. Screencast. We see that we have four functions. We have the create session which is to say we're going to be screencasting things and then we need to select the sources. So the dialog part I was talking about of the user saying I want this screen or I want this window, there's a number of options in here. Um, you can just look at the documentation. And then as soon as you're done with it, you say start. Start will be requesting a new stream to start and then once you get the stream, you pass it through the uh, open pipe wire remote, uh, remote, is it? And well, you're done with it. So there's like these four steps that we need to go through to uh, issue a session, and that's well, about it. So uh, what we will be doing here is just this. Well, this is to like set up the UI, so it's unrelated to the uh, all discussion here. Uh, we create the session. You make sure that the, um, so one thing that you always need to think about when doing Dbus is that this, uh, this is a service, so it doesn't like automatically return. We could be uh, being mindful at least of the synchronicity or asynchronicity of a, of, of, of a call is always useful. Uh, these generated interfaces always uh, generate an object. Um, so 
they always issue asynchronous calls because that's effectively what you want to um, aspire to. But then sometimes you want or it's useful to, whoa. Why is it bouncing? Well, you want to make sure that like, if you need the result, for example, like we do here, uh, then um, you just go wait on the return value of, for example, here, the create session, and that's fine. Um, so what we're doing here is we create a session, and we get a reply. The reply we get uh, is an object called a request, which is uh, for which we wait for the response. So this uh, is valid here. What is checking is just that. Um, like, is the world listening to me, right? Because the fact that you're declaring the object doesn't mean that the object is gonna be there. Uh, it certainly should be there, but, well, that's how uh, error handling works. Like, you need to uh, often make sure that the, the, the world is set up properly. Like, theoretically, you would be able to run this application into, a, like, a 25-year-old Linux, and then it would say, I mean, 25 maybe wouldn't even have to but, but uh, I don't know, 15-year-old uh, Linux, it would say, uh, yeah, Divas is there, but, uh, well, we don't know what the portals are, right? Um, so what that's about, what the is valid is here, but then, well, we get this response, and then effectively what we do is we wait for the response uh, reply. When we get a reply, we get to initialize it. So uh, what we're doing here is doing the select, select sources, the second call we're talking about. Again, we need to make sure that the call was uh, issued properly. And then we wait for the reply. And then um, when we get the streams, uh, we handle them. Uh, here by handling is by putting it, them into a window, which is what we're doing here. But um, well, a stream would be, in this case, uh, like an int uh, value that, uh, that you can do whatever what you think with it. Like, if you were doing a recording app, then you would put it into, like, the recording thing or whatever. Uh, I think that the rest is not super interesting. Um, maybe one thing worth mentioning is, like, the QML part of it. So like I was saying before, uh, we have this KPI wire that does the uh, the integration of like the technical bits of, of pipe wire so you don't have to. So here we can say, uh, well, the node, which is the int that is coming from the, from, from the portal, we put it here and then well, the rest of the information from pipe wire and, and then you're, you're golden, right? Did any of that make sense to anyone? I see a yes, that's good enough for me. Um, another example we can take a look at is the remote desktop uh, case, which is uh, what we're doing from KRFB, which is, like I was saying before, our um, uh, well, VNC server. Uh, so it also has the pipe wire aspect of it, I'm not going to go into it because it's more or less the same than we already saw, but that's the other side of, of the text input, uh, which I guess that is uh, somewhat uh, interesting as well. Uh, here again, what we did was uh, to generate the uh, XML file into a C++ class that we can use um, using well, the CMake macro we were talking about earlier. So now here we have the, the instance. Again, we need to say, well, what is the service that we're talking to, and that's, that's kind of it. Um, well, this code specifically is uh, well, only initialized when um, the session is already set up, so we don't need to do all of the preparing because it's done before. We just know how it, that, that it can be used. So here what is happening is that we have uh, well, a VNC client on, on, on the other side of the network that is telling us about um, key presses and, and mouse moves and all of that. And well, the only thing we need to do here is to relay that into, uh, into the compositor, right? Because that's what we do as an KRFB. Here we can see, for example, the, the, the function that 
is supposed to send the key, so we receive, or we are told this key needs to be pressed and we just notify uh, about it to the, to the portal and, and be done with it. Here, for example, we're not doing the wait for finished thing that, <laughs> we're not doing the uh, wait for finished thing that we were doing before because we don't, we don't care that much, right? Like we send it and when it's done, it's done. And I mean, arguably we could say, let's see if it ever failed or something, but I don't know if we would even have anything else to do, right? Like if the service is not responding to what we're doing, then probably that's, that's kind of it. Um, if, if you're trying to implement uh, uh, any of the other portals, something that you can also do is uh, look at the XDG desktop portal app. Uh, let me see if I can find it. XDG portal. KD test. Ah, I got it wrong. Terminal. XDG desktop portal. No, it's not. XDG portal. That's KDE, yeah. So that's the one, let me move it to where you can see it. Where is it? Yep, yep, yep. So with this application, you can more or less see all of the portals implemented, um, even those that are also implemented through the abstraction from Qt. This application is not using it because uh, it's not worth it. Or maybe it is, and then you do it, but Effectively, you can see all of the uh, features uh, more or less listed. Um, if you have any, like if you wanted to, for example, see how to well get user information, you could look at the code of this application. And I guess you can copy and paste it and then you credit Jan because uh, it's probably GPL. But um, yeah, take a look. Um, Bum, 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 bum. Uh, other things you can uh, think about is that at times you will need another portal. Not everything uh, that needs doing ever is there. Uh, consider doing it. You can open an issue and have the conversation about what it would look, need to look like or how else it should be done, whatever you need to do. Uh, whether it's adding a function into an, an, an already existing portal, whether it's like an entirely new thing, just well consider it. Uh, it's, it's a useful thing to do. Um, there's also a lib portal, uh, Qt5 library. I was, I've not been using it on my applications because uh, it seemed very related to using G variant. Uh, but uh, it's also a place where we could add some helpers at times if it was useful. Um, yeah, take a look and see if it has what you're looking for, uh, if ever. And yeah, if you have any questions, that now is a good moment to do it. Or, well, anytime during the conference, I'll be around for the whole weekend and a little bit more. Um, so I package uh, Qt applications as snaps, and so I'm very happy with the portal support uh, in Qt applications. Um, but one, one of the things I, I encounter is that sometimes users are using these applications on distributions that have older versions of the host uh, libraries for uh, portals. Um, and for some reason, most applications, when something like that happens, they don't really give users like really good feedback about what happens exactly. 
Sometimes ap um, um, the application, for example, tries to do it with a portal. Portal isn't available. It tries to do it directly, but that fails due to the sandbox. And then the user gets a message back, um, permission denied. Even though the actual issue is that the portal isn't available, and um, it would be really useful if users could have a more descriptive error message that says something like, I see that I'm running inside of a sandbox and this portal isn't available. Maybe contact the distro developers to update the portal or something like that. Yeah, error, error reporting is always, uh, like it's, it's an art, right? <laughs> and especially in these frustrating situations where like, even if you do your best, it's gonna be frustrating to the user because they, in the end, don't get to do whatever they wanted to do. Um, but yeah, like, it's always nicer. <laughs> I'm not sure if we can find a great way to say it now. We can have these errors better, easier, because in the end, I don't know. If you come up with an idea of how we, that could work at the technical level, let's do it, I guess. Maybe it could be done at the service level, right? Like, if I am asked about something that I don't know about, have a centralized way of reporting. But on the other hand, I think that telling users, make sure that you're on the la latest stable release of your uh, operating system, it's generally a good idea too, right? An another question I have is that it's, it, it might be that this is possible, um, but some applications use the open file portal to for example, open a project file, but then need access to the entire directory as part of that project file. Is this something that is possible or how should applications do this? There's other people who will be able to give you a better answer for that, but what I know is that uh, the open file portal was designed to give you a file descriptor more than an actual file and so that you could navigate through the whole directory uh, my understanding is that there is some uh, work into um, well doing the directory-wide kind of access, but I'm not sure we're entirely there. It's definitely a problem, especially like for IDEs and stuff like that, where you well, the one file is not really everything you're gonna need, right? But um, yeah, I'm afraid I don't really have a better answer for this right now. All right, thanks. Well, I guess if there's other questions, they can always add them to your whiteboard, I, right? I have a question. Oh, and it was on. based on his question about error. Um, I, I think it's hard to describe a user that they're running in a sandbox. And I, I think uh, the simpler approach would be to simply error and say, the maintainer needs to fix it. <laughs> and then to, I mean, it should just work, right? I, I think that's an, an important part of it. but. I think the error is good for the maintainer to understand what needs to be fixed, is I think is a, is a Well, general. but if the case is really that the user is on a, an old desktop environment version that doesn't yet know that, is, that a portal is gonna be a thing, like it's, <laughs> it's barely something that you can put on the developer. Like the developer can say, go talk to your distro, right? But it's still a frustrating conclusion. See, I knew it, I made an opinion. <laughs> Somebody is going to get it. Yeah, just for that, that the maintainer should uh, fix that. Uh, sometimes it's mostly in botch type of solutions for, for my, in my case, when I have the problems was with Flatpak, that my hacky solution was to just open flat seal and grant the file inside it so it doesn't fail with permission denied. So when it just errors to the user in the way, like it should be fixed, yeah, it should. But sometimes the more experienced users can fix it themselves when they see that. It's happened to me. Well, and that's mostly like the symptom of coming from a different security model where everything was available, right? 
like if you have designed the operating system from the get-go where I don't know portals and sandboxing is a thing you will as a develop app developer you will not do certain things that well if you're added into a sandbox uh, as an afterthought that you well at least you will need to rewrite some code which is never also a fun thing to do as a maintainer but yeah um, we need to adapt as a community that's why we're having less also can I ask when I will have a file I want to open it and I want the app to have the persistent access to it so when I open it again it can access the file is that possible to do with the portal somehow I don't know about the files but uh, similar things already been done for screencasts like if you have a screencast going you close the application you open it again it will request the same one you had so we certainly have the means to do this kind of things. We need to make sure that it's doable for, for example, for files and, and similar things. Right, thank you. So it's, uh, it's uh, 12.45, like, or past 12.45. Um, if there's no more questions, I'd like to thank Alish for his talk. Thank you. Please applause.